Welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we can sit back, relax, take that midweek break, and talk about all the fun things going on in the world of Linux. I'm Vin. <laughs> that is Jill and Juan Pedro Mateus. Hello. Joining us with you live. Get to talk about the fun mm. stuff. What's going on, everyone? Jill, you've been watching a lot of keynotes. Oh, yeah. I have I think I've uh, watched all of them now at uh, the Red Hat Summit in Boston. And it was a very electrifying atmosphere. It was a really, it looked like a really fun convention. And I'm considering going next year. <laughs> that should really be fun. fun. Pedro, did you adopt any new laptops? I did not. Mm -hmm. I did, uh, however, get to play around with some Android and some Lineage OS. Yes, it was a bit of a thing getting uh, <laughs> Lineage OS on this particular Huawei P8 Lite. Because I, for a moment there, I was stuck in a circle of nope. <laughs> because in order to um, get the code to unload the boot, uh, unlock the bo the bootloader, I had to have root because the code was stored in a hidden away partition. And in order uh. to get that, I had to have custom recovery installed. But in order to get that, I had to have <laughs> an unlocked bootloader. So yeah, just getting out of that initial loop was... Uh, thing all of its own oh boy <laughs> i want you yeah. to record yourself doing that blindfolded and i'll be impressed <laughs> oh <laughs> i couldn't read the xda forums if i was blindfolded hard mode man hard mode. <laughs> i've been doing a lot of stuff uh, my adventure started yeah. um after we got the show together on sunday and got that pushed out to create a dedicated jack box a jack audio box a butter robot that mm -hmm, was fun nice. And since I didn't realize until the end of that experiment that I sent my audio interface that I was planning on using to Canada, <laughs> I was like, right, I did that. So I've been playing around with the Jack networking. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of a smoke test. We have the audio coming through the router right now, which is kind of dodgy, but I'm going to do it to mm -hmm. Direct link, if everything flies back uh, from the interface, from the two boxes, it seems to be working, but I'm definitely going to throw like um, some retired enterprise hardware in there because those SPF cards are uh, cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes. um, hook these two up. And I just want to give a shout out to X Windows, man, because I'm pulling up the Audur and the Matrix Grid and all that with just X11 forwarding, and it's working brilliantly. Yay. Like, this is the mm -hmm. one thing I thought I was going to have to fight with. Didn't have to fight with it. Everything else nice. I had to fight with. Just not this. <laughs> so I'll take that. But mm -hmm. yeah. we need not to panic because <laughs> yes. IBM is not going to destroy Red Hat as we know it. Yeah. Yeah. As as so, <laughs> <laughs> so IBM CEO. Ginny Rometty stated once again that Red Hat would remain independent as promised, you know, despite the acquisition of IBM and, and Red Hat, um, that they are going to keep Red Hat, uh, you know, uh, let them do what they do best. And, you know, IBM has always been a great steward to open source and was one of the first companies to embrace Linux with using Apache in 1998. And they invested $1 billion in Red Hat in 1999. So that was that was really amazing that early on in, in the evolution of Linux. And I actually enjoyed watching many of the keynotes at last week's Red Hat Summit in Boston. And uh, Ginny Ramuddy key keynote with Red Hat CEO Jim Whitehurst was one of the highlights. And during this keynote, Ginny during the keynote talked about the importance of an ecosystem to drive innovation that open governance in open source is vital. And she quotes, if you're going to take, you have to give. And that Red Hat has built a wonderful culture about open. And there were lots of cheers in the audience over those comments. So that was very, very important. And yeah. don't worry. <laughs> so. Yeah, allowing the company you just purchased to keep doing what they're doing and what made them profitable in the first place. Yeah. Probably mm -hmm. a very good idea. I think uh, Electronic Arts, for one, would uh, <laughs> probably appreciate that lesson. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My first thought to that is don't panic because. 
IBM didn't buy Red Hat to start messing with it immediately. Yeah. I don't think, mm-hmm. you know, we we're, were in any immediate worry then. But, you know, hey, man, the CEO has said, everything's cool, be like the Fonz. And we all know that CEOs are beacons of honesty and trust. So, <laughs> now, to be fair, <laughs> yeah. uh, IBM's a pretty big company, and they've been doing a very good job of staying out of the news for many, many years. Yeah. Basically, they got into the news because they bought uh, Red Hat. That That's about it. But that's a good sign. You don't yeah. have, you know, a Randy Pitchford as a CEO of the company. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see, man. Uh, everything seems to be, you know, pretty much business as usual. And I think it'll stay like that. IBM and Red Hat have yeah. worked together for a long time. For We've years. definitely talked about that. Um, yeah. I don't think there's much to worry about, but, yeah. you know, I know there's definitely people. IBM has been around for a hundred years and they've not been good stewards when, you know, basically any company that has a monopoly or anything on lockdown to the level, mm-hmm. like say Microsoft did in the nineties or IBM in the eighties or anything like that. There are people that just will not do business with IBM. Yeah, no, huh. and it's um, there were there was a lot of resentment back in the day when they sold off the uh, laptop bits to Lenovo, mm-hmm. and honestly, I think Lenovo has actually been doing a very good job because as someone who has an X two thirty and an X two forty and one of the cheapo idea pad ones, they did a good job, and as far as IBM is concerned. Buying Red Hat was a very smart move. It's like oh, yeah. enterprise uh, a hardware provider buying a software provider. It's like, yes, <laughs> that's just, you know, match made in heaven. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I kudos to uh, Ginny Rometty to, for letting uh, Red Hat do their own thing. It's yeah, everything nice. I've read about her, she seems like a very chill CEO. So. Yeah, she's like, okay. I have a business. I want it to be successful, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, hundred <laughs> percent down with that. Uh, quick point, little thing we want to throw in. Uh, Arthur and threw this into our show notes. If I can get to the right <laughs> it's a Steam <laughs> update. No, um, <laughs> all my video boards switched around too. Uh, Linux kernels prior to five, not eight. You might have noticed mm-hmm. earlier this week that your distribution is like, "Yo, you need a new kernel." Like, what does it do? Now <laughs> it fixes a remote code execution. Um, that was uh, yeah. Just a quick note: update your business. You wanted to get that taken care of. It's also worth a mention that isn't there a new fancy uh, Intel flaw? Yeah, the there is. Uh, there was a new speculative execution. Well, four new uh, speculative uh, speculative execution CVEs that Intel released uh, earlier yesterday. <laughs> And it's, uh, yeah, it, it's basically more Spectre. It's more speculative execution. And Intel released a paper that in no uncertain terms said you should disable hyperthreading because, hey, it's, that's where the vulnerability lies, or at least it worsens it considerably. What do you so, think at this point that like Intel should? I'm really surprised they're not facing a class action lawsuit. Because oh, they will. <laughs> you can't. Now, honestly, for the home user, I don't, I mean, okay, maybe yeah. that's not going to be an issue. Mm. Leave hyper-threading on. But I would definitely use them as like, hey, man, I bought this because of this feature and can't really use it right now. And as it turns out, there are a lot of Xeons out there with hyper-threading running a lot of very powerful machines, running a lot of very mission-critical servers. So... Yeah, <laughs> but uh, the uh, kernel issue, uh, as it turns out, it wasn't as bad as it uh, may seem initially. Now, yes, it is a severe vulnerability. Uh, the CVE rating as 8.1 uh, in severity, but when it comes to exploitability, it only has a score of 2.2 because it's actually very hard to get that particular race condition to happen. Mm. So... Yeah, it's it's not, you know, major security flaw in the Linux kernel like some uh, outlets were uh, reporting, but it is something to be aware of, and it's already been fixed. If you're running 5.1 already, you're good. <laughs> right. Okay, good to know. Up next, what do we have? Dun, 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 an app the store, app because, images. hey, man, XKCD, 927, it needs to be a thing. <laughs> 
What do we have? Uh, this is linuxappstore.io, and it's a front-end to App Image Hub, Flat Hub, Snapcraft, and it's searchable. I mean, you can yep. just go through your App Images, flat packs, what have you. Um, you know, if you really want to call it a store, okay. I mean, it just takes you directly to, you know, wherever you would be going, like Snapcraft mm -hmm. and the lot. Mm -hmm. But I do like that you can search through it. Uh, However, when you are going through it, you do a search, it doesn't tell you, like you get your result, it doesn't tell you if it's a flat pack, app image, or a snap. They have a little icon in the corner. It's that's a little it. yeah. bottom yeah. left. <laughs> so, you know. And it's hard to see, yes. <laughs> Here's another thing. I couldn't get it to show me, I searched around, you know, just querying it. I was like, there has to be at least one package in here that has a flat pack and an app image or snap or some mix of that. I couldn't find one. VLC. VLC. Okay, it does yes. do that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, yeah, no, uh, stepcraft.io is a very good idea, but honestly, what I wouldn't be opposed to is um, having a plugin um, that you can, yeah, you I, picked, I'd like to address you, my statement. You picked a specific one, go back nope, to I the top one. Nope, I just typed in VLC, that's all I did. <laughs> no, earlier you picked one of the uh, categories, just, Go back to the top. Yeah, category. you're not in the. You got to be the, in the all <laughs> section. <laughs> okay, now search for VLC again. Hey, there. there. You go. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I wouldn't be opposed to having a plugin mm -hmm. for like uh, this particular store or any of the stores that aggregate all these uh, snap uh, packages and all the flat packs and all of the app images into one as, you know, for Discover, GNOME Software, Synaptic, DNF Agora, literally any of those just have a plugin that lets you install one of the universal packages. Just, come on, or all of them. Yeah. It's, it's really not that mm -hmm. hard at this point. Come on. <laughs> yeah, Go Pedro. And I Go ahead. <laughs> oh, um, I was just uh, reiterating. I thought that was an excellent idea that Pedro had. <laughs> and yeah, this needs to be integrated into all the software centers. The Ub Ubuntu GNOME software center only shows repository apps and snaps. Mm -hmm. And the GNOME software app on Fedora only shows repository apps and FlatHub apps. And uh, what was also great is I actually first tried it on, on my phone and, and the searches work great on desktop and mobile. And uh, like Ven did for VLC, when I did a, a search for the GIMP, it came up with the app image and Snap Apps version and linked to the appropriate websites to download them via App Image Hub and Snapcraft.io. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, basically, the only UI thing I would have, even if you have it limited as to what I did, there you go, user error right there, is say I was like, oh, okay, Snap, Snap, but I'm doing a search, maybe show all available. Yeah. By default, mm -hmm. because that could be easily. It missed. is by default. By default, it, it does show all of them. I'm it's just, just saying that if, if you even down. mouse over. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, it should have the text underneath it instead of just the little yeah. icon in the corner. <laughs> That's a thing. Uh, I like options. <laughs> yes. But. <laughs> bad news, everyone. You got to get rid of it. Oh, no. It's going away. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, finally, oh. appreciate <laughs> Legacy IDE in the curdle. It's long overdue. Please pull. Thanks a lot. Peace out. Um, you're cool. You're cool. You're cool. Expletive deleted. You're cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much it. Uh, I, I really wanted to go out and get the pitchfork and be like, ooh. Then I looked around the house. And I don't. Outside of a very very ancient um, security recorder, which I did dig up, which I don't even know if it works. I don't have anything in the house with an IDE drive, period. And it's been a <laughs> long time. Like, I was thinking maybe a CD-ROM drive or a DVD drive. No. <laughs> no. Nothing. But I, mean, I, it, I have the one laptop. You. The T42. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, the the uh, yeah. the T forty two has still has a uh, like desktop ID, mm -hmm. but I'm very much looking forward to someone you know creating a separate package that introduces that functionality if need be. But yeah, by all means, get rid of it in the kernel. Yeah. 
It doesn't really need mm-hmm. to be around. I mean, I went and digging. Uh, Jill's going to talk on it oh, a bit <laughs> more, but you know, WD stopped making IDE drives in 2013, and Seagate way before that. Yeah. So this it's not like you can pick up a new one. So I, 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 I want to know if anybody could actually get mad about this, and I don't see that. Aww. <laughs> Unless your business revolves around legacy systems, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, as you can see behind me, I have hundreds of vintage, vintage old and old computers with IDE drives in them. But I use you know older versions of Linux for those. <laughs> but you know, uh, SATA has been around since the year two thousand and is almost twenty years old. If you can believe that, it's amazing. So it makes sense that the older IDE interface gets deprecated from the Linux kernel. And uh, David Miller is the maintainer for the IDE subsystem in the Linux kernel, as well as the networking system and Spark implementation. And he's talked about getting rid of some of the uh, Spark support as well in the past. (laughs) So uh, yeah, for newer computers, this makes sense. Ditching Spark as a whole, that that's uh, that's a flame war waiting to happen. Yeah, it <laughs> there's, is. There's a group of very dedicated people out there. Oh yeah, I've got a Spark behind me, Something so I, I don't want that to happen. Both of you is how much Spark still hides in corners in enterprise. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. It's yeah. Fair. It's still. But yeah. you know, we're talking about Spark, mm. uh, which I still do contract work with a lot of this. I, it's Fiber Channel. It's not yeah. IDE. I mean, you might yeah, run into SCSI. Exactly. It's 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 SCSI, which is well yeah. supported in Linux. <laughs> Although there were uh, talks of uh, dropping SCSI, but as it turns out, uh, the SATA drivers are built on top of the SCSI mm-hmm. functionality, exactly. so you can't yeah. get rid of that. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, Pedro Kwen is getting a fix. It's getting better. It's it's not Ish. a fix. It's a fork. Uh, it's uh, the KWIN Low Latency. It's a separate project it's available on its own GitHub. You can build it, you can try it, you can install it. Uh, in fact, uh, our Theron uh, in Chat Realm decided to install it and give it a try, and he tried it two times. Uh, first time, it mm-hmm. was more stuttery than the original KWIN, uh, according to our Theron, and the Shh. second time, it just core dumped. He does not believe in <laughs> folders, does he? Uh, <laughs> 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 there, there are plenty of folders, but there are also plenty of files. <laughs> uh, no, it's um, apparently uh, Arthur and didn't have a very good experience with it. And if you read the description, uh, basically the uh, the creator is saying, in order to get rid of the um, like the stutteriness and the weird uh, latency that you get between the mouse cursor and say you're dragging a window around, mm-hmm. there w- there is one workaround, which is to basically say, tell KWIN that your monitor is a 200 hertz monitor and increase the maximum FPS limit to 200. Mm-hmm. But that actually makes mm-hmm. input latency a little bit worse. Not so much on the inputs and what you're doing, but on the responsiveness of KWIN itself. So you just get like the um, laggy, like chur, chur, yes. chur, chur. That's better than Wayland. Do you know what happens on Wayland? What? It stops. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah. But yeah, the the fix that he suggests, and that's part of the reason why he forked everything and is uh letting everyone test it, is um basically introducing a different kind of uh sync to V blank to synchronize everything to the latency that your inputs already have. Uh if you have a USB mouse or a USB keyboard, you're looking at the very least, like um, 100 hertz, uh, so about a millisecond of uh, latency on that. And when it, once everything goes through and it's pushed out to your monitor, you're looking at, you know, after going through the latency on all the other buses and being presented to you, you still have like 60 hertz on your monitor, so that's another 16.6 uh, milliseconds to account for. And... What he does is basically sync everything. So where the mouse cursor is, is where the animation or the window dragging or whatever else should be displayed. Now, if you've ever dealt with VSync on a video game. I was game, about to say, during this explanation, I've installed um, XFC4 like nine times. 
Yes. <laughs> uh, if you've ever played a video game, you know that introducing VSync is not exactly the best yes. way to lower <laughs> latency. In fact, it may actually make uh, input latency worse. worse. And KWIN has yeah. a lot of issues, like mm -hmm. a lot of issues, specifically compositing, and that's at the core of the issue here. Uh, and random disappearance of icons in the tray if, say, you turn on a Bluetooth controller. They fix that now, but it was a thing for a while. Uh, so basically what I'd say is disable uh, KWIN compositing completely and use Compton or X Comp MGR instead because mm -hmm. it's those are better compositors than K Win compositing will ever be. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> K Win's its own thing, man. I personally never played with it, but when I hear K Win, I'm thinking 97.7 FM. People out in Cali <laughs> will want to get that one. Um, <laughs> I was reading up on it just for this. You I mean I know what it is conceptually. And they say the number one feature of K Win, as listed at userbase.kde.org, is stable and reliable. <laughs> no, no, it number isn't. one, the first feature. I figure that works the same way people think ingredients work. That's not how they actually work, but how you think that should work. But uh, it's not 100. percent You know, I've learned from Kwin that it can be a dodgy experience through Pedro, and Pedro's determined like I'm still going to use it. More power to you. But uh, Tilda Arrow, the creator of this repo, is trying to do something about it. And I say good work on that. It he does point out, you know, like KDE itself, it's not recommended for low end systems. It's just mm -hmm. not. Yeah. If anyone mm -hmm. tries to sell you that bill of goods, just tell them no. And no, you know, Gnome and KDE do not rhyme with low end <laughs> systems. <laughs> no. <laughs> Speaking of gnome, look at that segue, oh, yes. ladies and gentlemen. Uh. Um, <laughs> Christopher Davis, uh, kind of new to GNOME, uh, has written a little bit in the GNOME blog about the basics of what it takes to get GNOME out. And he's like, I've been working with the GNOME community for a little under a year and a half now. And he just wants to cover, you know, the tooling, how apps are created, and how changes happen across the ecosystem, which is really good, man. Um, Pedro, you, you had some thoughts on this. Oh yeah, I, well, I, I guess thoughts. we should point. He talks about the release cycles, uh, you know, feature <laughs> freezes and code freezes, mm -hmm. app maintaining, and everything else. Now, yep. let, let let's get Pedro's hot take. Gnome's biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, clearly myself. Uh, the, this is going to be a series of articles, as he says, and he starts out by saying, um, "I've been working in the gnome community for a little uh, for a little under a year and a half now." Oh, sweet innocence! May mm. you never be corrupted, <laughs> because <laughs> for one. I hope that uh, this particular series of articles uh, actually includes a detailed description of the mental gymnastics <laughs> that uh, birthed Gnome 3. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right, yes. Uh, <laughs> or maybe, maybe, you know, uh, since, you know, GTK 4 is a thing and Gnome 4 <laughs> will be soon to follow. Uh, I hope we'll get an inside view of whatever mind-boggling decision or decisions uh, to actually take place when uh, developing mm -hmm. GNOME 4. Yes. <laughs> I, I I really hope... I, call it catharsis? Hey, I really man, hope that's I a was, thing I we get to... trying to reflect read. your inner child when you think about GNOME. You, you, yeah. you, you just like, boom, you sit down and you pick up a haterade, and you're like, okay, well, let's talk about GNOME. Um, I, you know, check it out, man. I mean, Chris uh, throws it down like a nice TL... Yeah. DR mm -hmm. at the end. He's like, it's community individuals, their own motivations, visions for everything, all the projects at their best. And, you know, when you boil down that statement, uh, you know, it's like if a project developer, you know, somebody working X or Y, it's not going to fix a bug that you want or implement a feature that you want. This is the GNOME blog and the GNOME, this is their polite way of saying, don't bug us about it. We're not their boss. You know, you don't go narc on them. There's nothing we can do. This is people working on their own time to develop this. So mm -hmm. I think it's a good. Message. And then Gnome 3 is born. Yeah. Hang on, hang on, Pedro. Say that one more time. Uh, Gnome 3 sucks. 
<laughs> it sucks. <laughs> Wah. It sucks. <laughs> Why don't you just go back and kiss Katie K1 again? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm running K1 right now with Compton, but I'm running K1 right now. Because <laughs> K1 compositing sucks. Oh, yeah. man. Uh, okay. LVFS. Yeah. So Richard Hughes is asking the Linux community for our help and a simple way to contribute to the LVFS that will only take a few minutes of your time. He is working on a new feature for the Linux vendor firmware service that will include human readable descriptions of each module loaded by the UEFI instead of just the hype. Really? Yes. Just the hype. Uh <laughs> <laughs> So basically, LVFS, if you don't know, it's a teeny tiny little um, tool that allows you to upgrade the firmware and manage all of the uh, tools that have open firmware going on uh, in the world of Linux. Uh, There was a bit of a spat between them and uh, System76 a while back. Uh, So System76 are now doing their own thing. But LVFS has actually gotten a lot of support from a lot of big companies. And as such, and as uh, as it is a project that the GNOME people are very keen on uh, developing, they're basically saying, if you don't know anything about, um, you know, programming, Go if you have a device that you'd like to see uh, support for, because there is an updated version uh, of the firmware, and you don't want to have to install Windows to get it up and running. Um, just Google it. Just uh, do some LS USB. Find out uh, what the controller is. Do some Googling. Paste that into uh, the descriptions for each of the modules, and uh, that will help a great deal because then the GNOME team can go to the uh, hardware developers themselves, and it's like, okay, this is the hardware, this is the firmware, we can serve this to you now. (laughs) Jill? Go on. Oh, they, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pedro, for helping during <laughs> during that. Uh, yeah. So um, um, with an easy Google and DuckDuckGo search, I contributed to Richard Hughes's UFI modules description Google Doc um, about the uh, actually his Realtek uh, PXE uh, module that needed some description, and there are hundreds in there, and they're they're easy to find the descriptions for. Some of them are, some of them aren't. There are ones that I I tried a few that we couldn't come up with any searches for. (laughs) So some of them are just him guessing. But anyways, uh, it doesn't take up very much time. I spent actually about, uh, probably about 45 minutes doing it because I did uh, several of them. (laughs) That's pretty neat. That Um, was really cool. Yeah, if you have the time, that is valuable information that people don't think about it until you need it. So yeah. yeah, you need the research done to figure out exactly what it is so you can actually have that and implement it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if you get a minute, a link to that will be in the show notes. You can go check it out along with everything else. But we have two conflicting stories. Yes, we do. <laughs> Which yeah. doesn't really happen very often. And this one, uh, well, the first one comes from the Linux Journal. And it's, you know, <laughs> alarmist clickbaity article title aside, there is a bit of a point here. So the article is titled, We Need to Save What Made Linux and FOSS Possible. It's like, how more melodramatic can you make it? But uh, the, the article itself, and Jill will get into the nitty gritty of it, actually mm-hmm. does have a point because if you work uh especially in like any type of government job like i do you're dealing with a heavily proprietary environment all the damn time it's actually yeah, annoying sometimes yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it, and uh the the article actually goes into the whys of uh getting away from that proprietary uh system and ecosystem uh, is very important and will actually benefit uh, in the long run and the short run as well. If we're honest, it'll basically save the engineer's brains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, Doc Searles, who is the editor in chief of the Linux journal who wrote this article writes, we collaborate inside proprietary environments such as Slack and Google Hangouts. Yeah, this is true for the most part, although I'm actually seeing a lot of companies moving to open source options, such as Rocket Chat and Mattermost, 
because of the issues with Skype and and uh, uh, Google Hangouts uh, may be deprecated soon, but you know they'll have an alternative for that, I'm sure. But anyways, uh, Doc Searles later in the article states with concern. One might even argue that most of the Linux deploy deployed in the world today is embedded inside proprietary and closed devices. Yeah, and after reading this article several times and seeing actually Lawrence Lessig, Cory Doctorow, and Vince Cerf speak about these concerns at recent Linux conventions, I understand that we need to keep the innovation and freedom of general purpose computing of general purpose computing and Linux and open source software alive, despite living in a containerized world. Yes, it's very, very true. Sorry, I had to take a break. <laughs> yep. I was installing Arch on Windows. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that now. <laughs> yeah. And it'll download the Linux kernel as well. Uh, <laughs> Strange times. <but> yes. <laughs> Linux, it's still a thing. It's still around. In fact, yeah. 2019 might be the year of the Linux on desktop. This is not a yeah. repeat from... Ever, yeah. right? Yes. <laughs> Time and memorial. Remember yeah. when Linux was Are the data Are we still saving? doing this? Okay. Everything runs yeah. Linux, including <laughs> Windows, man. Uh, that That's just something. Mike threw this and I was like, yeah, okay. I thought it was a good balance out to, you know, Chromebooks, your mobile devices, desktop, laptops, Windows. 100%. It's every, it's in your TVs. It's in your cars. Yep. It's, it's in your Teslas. TiVo's, uh... VCR is back in the day. There was, <laughs> there's so much uh, hardware like home appliances out there running some kind of Linux. Yeah. That, yeah, I mean the, the year of the Linux desktop as like the dominant desktop operating system will never happen. No, no, no. <laughs> Here's the thing: the ultimate goal is Linux desktop is going to sit around one or three until we can dumb it down enough. To where you know, a simpler <laughs> person can use it. But you don't really need to dumb it down. All Linux needs is the exact same thing that Microsoft has, which is you, a massive marketing company throwing money at OEMs to say, pre-install this on don't, your laptop. Don't, don't, don't talk down to me, Pedro. I'm a Windows desktop <laughs> expert. I click the next button very well, and I find Linux confusion. <laughs> I'm a Linux desktop system administrator, and I'm hoping to move to the infrastructure team managing Windows servers. I, I, I've heard the yeah, legends, I click Pedro. next real I've heard good. the legends. Your type can click two next buttons at one time. <laughs> uh, Freaking Active Directory makes my blood boil. But hey, you know, at I, least yeah. it's better than SharePoint. <laughs> completely on the side jack on that, man. Uh, my friend is Active Directory runs a whole segment of University of Georgia and I was in his office looking at that and I said, Nope, that was my just like, uh uh. Yeah, no. Yeah, it's, no. It's, it's far more complicated than it has any business being, but it's a thing. Yeah. Hey, something that makes us say, oh yes, is yeah. the 122 oh, yeah. beautiful party patrons making our show possible live, commercial free. Giving in that spirit, that is Linux, and yeah. we like to give you some stuff back. You get a custom RSS feed for a show, a secret special show that only uh, super cool people can listen to. It's our production meeting every week if you want to know what's going on behind the scenes and access to the uncut business, what we do. And oh, uh, yes. that's the creepy super shows. And, and you let us do this show and our Saturday show and our Tuesday streams and our Thursday streams. Where, you know, we might catch that wandering Windows user. They'll be like, wait a minute, you're doing all this on Linux? Like, yes, one of us. <laughs> Come on. Right? Yes. Um, <laughs> that'll be the thing. <laughs> Definitely want to thank everybody supporting us like that. we got a store if you want to confuse people with our merch. Hell, Alex, that, that'll throw them off. Maybe a chair. What's that mean? I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. And finally... <laughs> We got some hardware. We get a little shopping list for stuff for the studio. Exciting things like network cables, but that also helps us out. And <laughs> all the other people who have done that in the past end up on yeah. Frank's wall. He'll show up in the credits. I took a new picture of him. He is Aww. so sexy. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> all right. Oh, and access to our Discord. Come hang out with us. We're yes. weird in there like six days a week. Uh, we have IRC. We don't like doing stuff behind the paywall, so you can always join in for that for free. But we kind of got a little, you know, Campagan Club where we can be weird and like semi-private. It's kind of fun. <laughs> Very semi. Cool, <laughs> Pedro. 
What does this mean? <laughs> this means we're about to uh, put some pizza in our mouth. No, no, we're talking about no. the raspberry pie because it's the slice of pie. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. yeah. Dun, dun, dun. So, actually, a website that I'm a big fan of, Notebook Check. Jill, what's this about? Yeah, yeah. So this is the... RPI Relay, which is an expansion board or hat for the Raspberry Pi that will allow you to use a Raspberry Pi A+, B+, 2B, 3B, and 3B+, to control your home appliances. And what's really cool is this hat can handle the high voltages and currents that um, home appliances require. And it's actually only $18.99, a much cheaper option for smart home automation than the other alternatives. <laughs> oh, so really those cool. uh, three <laughs> green things there are just straight up fuses. Okay. Yes. I, gotcha. I, I'm, yes. tempted, I'm tempted to order this because on Amazon, ninety two seventy four for installation. Yeah, Amazon does that. Uh, if you go look at an SSD, Pedro, it's Pedro, like... Pedro, Pedro, I want to take them up on this one, though. <laughs> Yeah, that is, no, but it's that like a cool. SATA SSD, and it's like, <laughs> oh, you can buy this SATA SSD. It's like one twenty gigs for I don't know eighteen pounds, uh, and you can pay for the expert insulation, which is another fifty pounds on top of mm -hmm. that. Yeah, <laughs> well, like, really, with, with this, this is the morbid curiosity because I don't even know what I would do with the uh, hat to with a relay switch. I mean, I I could come up with something. But yeah. See, the expert installation is dude walks up to your place, you give him the Raspberry Pi, and he goes like this. <laughs> Done. <laughs> I, I, That's I, your ninety ninety dollars right there. <laughs> I'd have to put it on a string and like make him chase it for a little bit or something. Then I, yeah. I, I don't do <laughs> okay, this is neat because this is something for the first time. You know, we've we've talked about what's coming up next a billion times, but this mm -hmm. is something you might actually carry around. It has yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would say a pretty reasonable TSA acceptance factor. Yes, oh, yes, it does. Yes. You'll probably want mm -hmm. to sand down those 3D printed parts a bit more and put a little clear coat on it to hide them. But it's it's like, you know, the, the holy grail. It's uh, the laptop that fits in your pocket that's built on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and the... Um, it comes from hyperglitch.com. Okay. Yeah, I know. I just realized. I was like, wow, even with the um, JavaScript enabled. This yeah, no, is, that's it. Yeah, that, oof, that's the website. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, um, the Spartanness of the website aside, uh, they actually give you everything that you need, uh, like detailed instructions, uh, the software, and a little bit on how to do the connections for the stuff and the battery that you're looking for to set up your own teeny tiny Raspberry Pi portable I'm computer. looking at the wiring on the back. And, okay, speaking of uses of IDE cables. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. We've I mean, been, uh, you're going to have to be dealing with a very constrained space. This with a lot of wires. Now, now the, yeah. the, this is me breaking out my etchant tank and uh, eagle and <laughs> making a PCB because I've been here. I've been here, and that's not a that that that's getting taken apart a lot. So all that's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, they do say that the Raspberry Pi itself, you can uh, take it out and plug it back in with minimal friction. It's just everything oh, else that attaches. Could I, tape it? could I tape it to my face? You <laughs> yeah. could, yeah. but that screen is probably not high resolution enough for you to have a good experience. At this <laughs> price, I could get two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at that point, if you could get uh, X to sync between the two, yeah, you're fine. But, but go ahead. But look at that. Look at the finished product. That's something you could open in public that, and be like, "That's yeah. amazing." I yeah, kind of awesome. want one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Aww. I've yeah, always no, been on that, the lookout for the world's smallest laptop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even though I couldn't read it, I have to bring a magnifier <laughs> with me. <laughs> oh, get one of those Game Boy magnifiers that you'd like. Yeah. <laughs> there, mount there. on top. Yeah. That, that's the next project right there. Is the speakers and the, I'm just get outrageous with it. That looks really cool. I'm digging yeah. that. I like everything right up to the point of the spaghetti nightmare of wiring. A, because I'm rubbish at soldering, but mm -hmm. B, I'm also rubbish. At, no, I'd rather make a board for that. But cool project. Do it yourself. 
Maybe you make something cool or you got an idea like that and you want to tell us about it. You got a question, thoughts, hints, allegations, something better left unsaid. <laughs> While you can leave a comment on YouTube, we don't immediately take that as you want it read on the show. So mm -hmm. we've come up with this brand new revolutionary idea for you to contact us. Pedro? Yeah, it's uh, the groundbreaking thing that if yes. you created <laughs> your own contact form on your very own website, that people would realize, oh, okay, maybe this is the one that they actually read. And as it turns out, that is actually the case. So if you go to LuxGameCast.com and you hit the contact button, there's a form. Make sure to pick LWDW to send feedback to this very show where we will be happy to feature your comment. If you want to send some hate mail for that Saturday show, what we do, you can. You can mm -hmm. ask Jordan for relationship advice. Or if you're a game developer, make sure to include three keys, but that's for the other show. So I won't tire you with that particular show. Hey, maybe, <laughs> maybe for like whatever reason. Maybe you're Black Magic and want to send us three dongles for DaVinci Resolve. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can use one of those. Yes. <laughs> and I'll, I'll be back next week and be like, thanks for sending one. <laughs> <laughs> we do get a lot of that from game developers. Oh, it's like, yeah. but could you just play it anyway and talk? It's like, wait, well, there's three people to. Uh, never mind. Okay, up first. <laughs> <laughs> up first, terminals. Yeah. Okay, so Zoe uh, <laughs> has been on a quest to find the perfect distro for her. Um, and. Recently, uh, she's been looking at uh, various fancy terminal emulators to replace the simple but slightly underfeatured SD simple terminal by Suckless. Uh, I was curious what your favorite terminal emulators are or if you've seen any interesting ones about. Thanks. Terminator. <laughs> yeah. Th just yes. use Terminator. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pedro, you're missing My the point. You're missing the point, bro. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, you want the fancy stuff. Uh, yeah, th this isn't about having a <laughs> functional terminal. This is about whispering fluffy BS. Uh, then in that case, uh, I don't know. I, th I just use Terminator. It does Aww. everything I needed to. <laughs> this, this is a delicate balancing act because you can get something that's whispering sparkly cowboy boot, but then a lot of times you're like, I can't really use this. It's too much. So you got to find that balance between... Does it look all right? And can I still get it done? Like me, it's like cold pizza or pizza and sex and all that. As long as I have a terminal, I'm okay. <laughs> you know, it, I'm you know, imagining Ven eating pizza. It's like, ooh, terminal. <laughs> listen, yeah. man, if I could catch it, I would eat it. Okay. Um, Aww. The GNOME terminal is fine. I use XFCE terminal. I use just TTY, Control Alt F2. That's a terminal. You know, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. For me, it's Terminator because it it has all the TMUX functionality built in, so you could just yeah. right click, split it, done. <laughs> well, I was thinking about you know, um, I remember uh, Strider was like, "Oh, check out cool retro term." And I was like, "Ha, huh, let's see, uh, apt install seventy, ha ha." Meant no. Not downloading <laughs> 70 megs for a terminal, man. That defeats the point. Well, Zoe, my go-to terminal is still the classic X term, but I create a .x resources config with lots of settings at startup, including a much larger font size. Oh, yeah, because um, the font on that is like yeah, nine, to, nine I can't, points. I can't, even, I can't even use it. I have to, I have to do an X resources on every computer uh, just so I can even read the terminal, <laughs> the X term. <laughs> but I also love E term, the Enlightenment term, Terminal Emulator, which has always been one of my favorites, and it's really pretty. And you can do. Oh lots yeah, of that one has a lot of on effects. Enlightenment is yes. not bad at all. Um, I yeah. know. Uh, Ethereum <laughs> just brought up console. The console's great, right? Until the, you realize, mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, I accidentally got KDE on this box. Oops, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like all of the KDE dependencies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and. Yeah, I also like Terminix because, you know, you can use the uh, have four terminals up at once. And that's really convenient when you need to get a lot of work done. And I actually Terminator use... left you have <laughs> yeah. as many as your monitor resolution will allow. Just saying. that's very true. Very <laughs> true. <laughs> and a cool retro term because I enjoy it. I sometimes just go to it just because I like the look of it. And uh, we've talked about it extensively here on LWW. <laughs> so <laughs> we. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't need GLX compositing 
in my terminal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I. I don't know, man. You you run KDE, man. So I, I, was... I do, but again, I don't need an entire GLX context dedicated to. I know, I know. You a have, terminal. You have KDE installed. You don't have the resources left. <laughs> <laughs> I need all those resources. Yes. <laughs> I'm just thinking. I love KDE. Um, okay. Last but not least, uh, I think this question's geared at Pedro. Mm-hmm. Mr. B! <laughs> <laughs> well, see, clearly, it scared at me. Uh, so, have you gotten a Microsoft, uh, Microsoft? No. microphone to work on Resolve? Freudian operating system. Yes. Uh, I have tried it on Ubuntu and Manjaro with no luck. Does uh, not allow audio recording to resolve into Resolve. So mm-hmm. this uh, this is very much a comment on the uh, DaVinci Resolve video. What Ven made recently, and uh, Ven, what did you get? Microphone audio working in Resolve. You know, yeah, I'm gonna have to put it to you like this, Pedro. I never even applied thought to it because why would you need a microphone? <laughs> to work in a non-linear video editor? I guess narration recorded directly on the editor so it saves you from having to, I don't know, start up oh, dinosaur, uh, start up the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, on the floor. <laughs> uh, start up the like audacity or anything that'll let you record some audio and then import that over, mm-hmm. which that is the reasonable thing, and why would you be reasonable on the internet, Ven? Um, you should know better at this point. Uh, here, here's the thing. Um, <laughs> pro, pro tip from old man Ven is 100%. Use a nonlinear video editor for editing video. Do your audio work in... I, I know you're like, well, DaVinci Resolve has the audio thing. It's not for recording, you know? Even KDE in live is like, hey, we can do your webcam. Don't, don't, as soon as you start messing around with that, there's a direct line I can draw from that to, it crashes a lot. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I'm just yeah, saying. no, record separately first. Yeah, <laughs> record, then, then bring your media in there. Get your media baked. Use the right mm-hmm. tools for the right job. All right. I think that is going to do it. We're going to roll out of here. Maybe Indeed. get some audio going. And check those credits. Oh, yes. Oh, snap. Oh, you promised a new picture of Frank. <laughs> Give me a minute. Jeez. <laughs> we need... I'm sorry. I, I've been not what? seeing Frank's... Uh, what? There it is. What? <laughs> Where's your Frank at? Right there, oh, Pedro. Yes. <laughs> There's your Frank being all the frank all the beautiful people on the fine upstanding citizens because that's what it stands for you dirty minded individuals there's yeah one, there's one spot <laughs> left 2.0 and then we'll need the the um, fine upstanding cannibal wall 3.0 <laughs> <Ugh. laughs> or a 2.1 it's just a like some stapled bit of cardboard below it <laughs> right <laughs> Uh, thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next Wednesday bye say bye Jill Jill how dare you (laughs) jeez